My fun is not over yet, though, because I get to moderate a panel with three fantastic people in it. Could I ask my panelists to come to the stage? And as they do, I will introduce them. So we've got a panel that we tried to, to title provocatively. The title of our panel is The Disruption of Just About Everything, which I don't think is a huge overstatement. And to help us with it, we've got three people who I consider to be fairly serious disruptors themselves and very interested in everything, as far as I can tell. So sitting closest to me is my friend Hillary Mason. Hello. Who, that's Hillary. Um, Hillary is the chief data scientist at Excel Partners here in town. She was formerly the chief scientist at Bitly, the URL shortening company that, that we all used excessively, and describes herself as a friend of the robots, which, <laughs> given the trends that we've talked about, is probably a really good thing to be. And um, Hillary is probably starting, is probably thinking of new ideas in her head. So one of my goals for today during the break is to find out what she's working on <laughs> next. Next to her is Bill Janeway, who is a partner and a senior advisor at Warburg Pincus, where he has been for a long time. Now, I know a lot of you are thinking, hey, we're in New York. You know, investment banking partners are not that thin on the ground. Um, what, what is thin on the ground are um, lifelong career bankers who have written you know, profoundly important books about the nature of, of technological progress and innovation and what that means for our economic engine and our capitalist system. It, a, a book that I can wholeheartedly recommend to you is Bill's book called Doing Innovation in the Capitalist. Doing Capitalism. Dang it, I got it backward. And for that, you get three demerits. Dang it. And it will close. be entered into your Bitcoin account. Damn it. <laughs> right. <laughs> and and we're, that's just how much disruption is going on that I'm actually upset about that, right? It's called Doing Capitalism in the Innovation Economy. And I can completely recommend it to anyone uh, interested in understanding fundamentally like what, what, what's the nature of the change going on these days. Uh, next to Bill is George Colony, who a lot of us are probably familiar with. George is the founder chairman and CEO of Forrester Research. I imagine more than a few of us have relied on Forrester reports for a long time. George has a lovely way to describe what, 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 uh, what excites him. Uh, you can't, I came across a great quote from you saying that your idea of a good time is when, a, when you are meeting with a client and they say, I had no idea or I didn't know that. And, and those of us who have been following Forrester for a while know that very few of any companies have done a better job of um, telling companies things about technology that they didn't know that were very surprising to them, all the way from the client server revolution to the first wave of the internet to web 2.0, the app economy, the internet of things. Forrester has been one of the very few go-to places to try to keep up with the waves of technological change that are hitting us. So we have three people in a wonderful position to talk about the disruption of just about everything. I'm going to pick on Hillary first. And a fellow data scientist, uh, Gil Abaz, the founder of Factual, made a really, really strong claim a while back. And I'd love to get you to react to it. He said, the world is one big data problem. <laughs> is, is, are you on board with that? I actually think there's a bias in the way you're asking me this question, in that it's not so much a binary, yes, this is true or not, but rather how much of the world much? is a useful data problem. Good. And yes, uh, we're finding out that quite a lot of the world and a lot of human behavior can be modeled in a useful way. And referring back to my experience at Bitly, which if you're not familiar with it, it's a tool for sharing links on social media. So there's a heck of a lot of pizza, Kim Kardashian, Justin Bieber, and breaking news that goes through these servers. Uh, from looking at the stuff, we see that human behavior is in fact much more predictable <coughs> than you might think on the surface. Um, and you can test that yourself. If I ask you what you did last weekend, you're probably going to tell me, oh, I saw a movie, or we went to a new place for brunch. You're not going to tell me you brushed your teeth. You know, you did all the things you always do. But the majority uh, of Are you your insulting time, my hygiene? Is that what, what's going on here? <laughs> I am not questioning your hygiene. I'm assuming, in fact, ah. that you engage in it on a regular basis. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But, but that's not what we tend to think about as human beings. But when you look in the data, you see that, in fact, we can actually model quite a lot of common behavior in a very useful way. So let me turn the question back to you. Is the stock market one of these things that is a big data problem, or is it not? 
Apparently not, though I'm 33% into Michael Lewis's book, so I hope to have a better answer by, the, by midnight tonight, probably. Okay, so it, it's a gameable system, but that's different than a predictable system. Well, I mean, from, from what I can see, having not worked in that area myself, is that uh, areas of it are gameable on information advantages or speed advantages, but not necessarily on you know, some simple model of the whole thing. Fantastic. Uh, Bill, I want to turn to you. Um, you're deeply involved with an institution called the Institute for New Economic Thinking. Can you give us a, 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 a short explanation of what's wrong with our current economic thinking or, or why we need a new generation of thinking about economics? And is I mean, it the, a data problem? Yeah. The In part, we're going to come back to MIT, but we're going to start with the gift that keeps on giving to financial economics, and that's the global crisis of 2008, Good. which broke the models and forced, first of all, forced a, a, a two-tiered assault on what had become conventional macroeconomics as practice in every central bank, every treasury, every major bank in the world. The, the, the pillars of which were? The pillars of which were that a consistent model could be constructed. Consistency is the, was, was the goal between the behavior of a, quote, representative, rational agent optimizing her utility and then taking that all the way up to a macro economy which functioned without any financial system, okay. since she didn't borrow and lend money to herself. Oh, all right. right. So in 2008, money, finance, the banks broke through the models. So the first thing, the first response has been, well, let's add some financial frictions to these macro models. Mm. And that's going on. A lot of people are working on it. And it's not enough. Because the other side is deep down underneath. For, for years, people had been working on understanding that market participants are not represented by one rational agent. Okay. They have a whole spectrum of attitudes, temperaments, access to information. They are heterogeneous. Now, when you start trying to model that, <laughs> the math gets a hell of a lot harder. Yep. In fact, it gets so hard that it starts pushing towards the limits of the ability to solve analytical problems and give you a closed form equilibrium solution. Good. So finally, there's a methodological transformation that is taking place. This takes me personally back to MIT, 1974, and one of the great names who somewhat perhaps compromised himself in the public eye. Jay Forrester. Jay Forrester, yep. industrial dynamics, systems dynamics, and the notion of simulating the behavior of systems too complex to, to resolve analytically. Every one of the natural sciences adopted computing between 30 and 40 and 20 years ago Good. to build simulation models. It's time for financial economics to start doing that. That's the kind of work we're pushing and supporting from the Institute for New Economic Thinking, bringing finance back together with economics and embracing the complexity, which means that, indeed, that uncertainty you talked about mm -hmm. with respect to causation and yep. correlation is central, should be central to the concern of economists. They should be less concerned about consistency and more concerned about understanding coordination failures, breakdowns, the sources of the discontinuities that create the opportunities for Axel Partners and for the venture capital firm Warburg Pincus, which hires investment bankers Whoops. to execute. <laughs> That's five more demerits, by Dang the way. It. My Bitcoin balance is now negative. Well, they probably were at Mt. Gox, so, Gox, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, by the way, I love the fact that when you're, again, you're talking to an MIT audience, you can mention a name like Jay Forrester and you get a woohoo from the crowd. It's just, it's just, just you don't get that very often. And, and he, my, my favorite story about 2008, um, and it, 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 there will be a point to the story. You, 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 uh, you and Eric have talked about the dangers to the labor markets of digital. But imagine we're in a highly digital, highly data driven world. There's also a danger of abstraction, I would call it. So I'm not going to name the CEO, but it's the CEO of a large Canadian bank whose young executive said, we have to get into credit default swaps. We have to get into this market. This is 2006. And so he said, OK, bring the guys from Goldman Sachs to JP Morgan, and I'll sit and listen to them. So he sat at the head of the table, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs. They talked for an entire day. Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan walked out of the room, and all the young executives, executives said, we've got to do this. We're going to do this, right? The CEO stood up and said, no, we're not going to do this. And they said, why aren't you going to do it? 
He said, because I don't understand. <laughs> he could, we had gotten to such a level of abstraction in using computers uh, to build those, those secure, the securitized mortgages, essentially, yeah. that no one really had a grasp of what we were, what we were dealing with here. Do you think so there's that, a danger of labor markets, but there's also a danger of abstraction yeah. to bring, uh, the whole system almost collapsed in no way. So I, I, I hear you, but do you still think that's a, a useful guide? Because it, it makes a ton of sense. I've tried to rely on it. You know, if I don't understand it, I'm certainly not going to invest in it. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to go further with it. But in a world that's becoming so complex, is that still a useful guide? We, are, are, we, we would like to think we're modern, this is modern mankind, but we're really our brains are 20,000 years out on the ancestral plane. We're still naked yep. running around out there, right? We have these computers that can do all this, but you know, we're, still, we're still very imperfect human beings. George, let, let so me. It's not, it's, I wouldn't, the age of the data, of data yes, but it's also, let's remember, it's the age of the human beings. Yeah, but you know. And, and you, you know, I may be able to get the right answer, but will I be able to sell it to the world? As an example, yep. global warming. We all know that's happening, but you cannot sell it to the American populace. They will not buy it. You know, George, the bankers have a long history of having a benchmark against which the ones that survive can test, and that is, can I follow the cash? Mm. Can mm. I follow the cash? Now, what oh. happened with credit default swaps, with credit default swaps <laughs> squared, with virtual synthetic credit default swaps squared, was that the ability to get to where the cash flows are became literally impossible. So even, so, an, even an informed, experienced person couldn't follow that cash? No, even, even 100 of your geeks yep. working for 100 chimp years with the best <laughs> computers <laughs> available yep. couldn't have found the cash. So I actually, I find this completely fascinating because in computer science we have this notion of interpretability of an algorithm. So when you build a system, are you mindful of the fact that you can understand what it is right. doing and, and interpret what is happening? Or are you happy with a black box machine where things go in and things come out and like maybe it is not possible? to reverse engineer it, and your, your cash flow analysis is sort of the same thing. Exactly right, exactly right. Andy Haldane at the Bank of England worked out that the documentation that you would have <laughs> to go through in order to find out where the cash was underneath one of these complex securities was about, it was almost up to your terabyte of pages. <laughs> Because to find out layered. who actually had the mortgage on that little old lady's house somewhere. Exactly. But Hillary, would you ever write an algorithm and even though it was getting you the right results, yeah. you, would hand it, you would hand it off to a customer or to your boss. You'd say, I don't know how it's working, but it's getting the right, right result. Would you do that? Sure. It's done uh, all the time, it, isn't yeah, it? Absolutely. Um, it's really about using the right tool for the job. So in startups, I generally advise against building uninterpretable systems because you have such limited resources. You're trying to build a product that if you do something and it doesn't work, uh, and you can't understand why it doesn't work, you have lost that entire effort. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you build something and you can at least learn why it didn't work, you've now learned something useful that you can use for the next iteration. Right. Yep. But there are black box models in use in all sorts of applications, and quite often it's totally fine. Well, the, the, the first except law... In, except in 2008. Yeah. This is the well, easiest no. panel I've ever moderated, right? I'm not doing a damn thing. This is fantastic. <laughs> You're doing great. I keep know. it up, Ed. Every time I open my mouth, I get you wrong, so keep, I'm going to stop. Keep smiling. <laughs> But the, 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 the first law of innovation is that it proceeds by trial and error and error, right? That it's a continual process of learning by doing, learning by failing, which the second law is that if you're dependent in order to justify an investment on calculating the net present value of the expected future cash flows, finance 101, everybody, you are never going to make an investment because you don't know what it will be until after you've realized it. And that's why the economics of innovation pose a really serious problem for the kind of mainstream, closed form, neoclassical production function that we're all taught in freshman economics and that we have to unlearn, at least by graduate school, if we want to do useful work. So, so Bill, in that world that you just described, how do successful venture investors go about their work? If, if, the, if, if the financial projections give them absolutely zero confidence, do you just do you look at the management team in the eye and go, I believe in well, you? Like, what do you do? My algorithm, when I get a business plan for a startup, start with the people, right? Start with the people, then look and look at their track record. You want people who have survived failed startups, near death experiences in big companies, and come out net ahead. Second, look at their ability to analyze the market. Then the technological innovation they propose, huh. recognizing, recognizing that there are lots of smart people 
who can do the technology, fewer of them who can understand the market. And then the last thing you do is you look at the numbers and, you know, when are we going to get rich? But it's, a, it's, it's irrelevant to the scale of the market matters, but the Fine. financial forecasts are irrelevant. Okay. George, does that make sense? Startups. I don't think Only so. Only startups. Uh, I think it's random. I, 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 think it's, I think Bill's been kidding himself his whole career. Uh, I mean, I got stuff wrong. I, I didn't well insult enough. the guy, yeah, but, though. This is, but, this is but, much worse. Having been in this industry many years, uh, like I, said, I, I always wonder, why did that guy get rich, and why did that guy, guy's company succeed? And at times, I think there's two big roulette wheels, right? Yeah. There's all these people on this roulette wheel, and there's all this, all this demand on this roulette <laughs> wheel. You just go tick, 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 tick. You know, and yeah, then suddenly, you know, Steve Jobs gets rich. But what Andy, that's not that random. But if you look, if you look at venture as an example, how many venture guy? If, if a venture guy has a 15 companies in the portfolio, yeah. how many winners will he have? In fact, have? in fact, what? in fact, as Andy would say, let's look at the data. This huge amount of deeply analytical, based on lots of data. And what do we learn? Venture capital return. We learn the following things. First of all, the returns are skewed all the way down, all the way down. They're skewed by firm, by fund, by within fund performance. Second, and this is key, there's persistence in the returns. Okay. And that persistence has actually persisted. This is the latest work. Persisted. As, as persistence is wont to do. Post, no. There was a discontinuity in 2000. Really? Yeah, you remember the dot-com bubble burst? Vaguely, yeah. Yeah, well, you were a kid. You know, you probably had hair. Wow. No, the, uh, no, no, no. There's one person here who was a kid, maybe in 2000. It's the, not me. The um, so you had you had from 1980 through 2012. You there had one is persistence. Fund one of firm X yep. predicts the returns on firm two. On uh, fund two. Fine. So that now the the second level of data says okay. Entrepreneurs who are serially successful, mm -hmm. doesn't matter where they get the money from. Doesn't matter. Because they know how to do it, and they can, they'll buy cheap cash from third tier venture guys, and they'll go out and build a company. Huh. But on, venture capital firms with persistently better track records do much better with first time entrepreneurs. And guess what? Every serially successful entrepreneur once did it for the first time. So there's a kind of feedback mechanism you can imagine whereby the better firms attract the better entrepreneurs. They have a reinforcing positive feedback loop, which would be a mechanism which the data, the correlations in the data suggest has some causal significance mm -hmm. as to why you see this persistence in venture capital returns. What you see is, of course, among the third and fourth year firms, a lot of churn. Fine. And by the way, there were 1,000 venture firms in 2000 who were given, in today's dollars, $150 billion. <laughs> Today, there are about 500 firms. They bifurcated. There's Axel and NEA and other very large firms. There are a lot of small ones. And they collectively are being given about $25 billion a year. Wow. The industry is going back to its roots as a craft practice. Do you think that's a good thing? I think it's the way of the world. I think that venture capital returns as a whole, not those outliers, are derivative of two institutions from the outside. Upstream research that's paid for mm -hmm. by people like the Defense Department or the old Bell Labs, and venture guys, when those gets into the public domain, they can take advantage of it. And second, financial speculators, productive, productive bubbles yep. that lead to the mobilization of capital on a scale that, going back to neoclassical economics, would never been, be produced by rational investors calculating the net present value of their expected future returns. And you do make this sharp distinction between the productive kind of bubble, the 1999-2000 right. bubble, and the crazy unproductive kind of 2000, 2000 and 2007, 2008 bubble. Absolutely. Right. Bubbles are banal. They happen wherever you have liquid markets. Yep. A lot of the times, they're about tulip bulbs. They're beach houses in the Nevada desert. They're gold mines. Nothing. Maybe they're bitcoins. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but occasionally, canals, railroads, electrification, uh -huh. uh, aviation, radio, PCs, Fiber. the internet, yep. they, they, they have the potential to create new economies. I agree with you, by the way. I think we're halfway through, at best, the transformation of the economic architecture of the world through digitization. It's very important to note that, uh, and I know the argument that you and Eric have been having with 
my friend Bob Gordon out at Northwestern, um, 50 years after the B&O Railroad began to be built, it was 50 years after that that, Wells, uh, that, that um, Sears Roebuck became an idea, mm -hmm. an idea. It wasn't even a business. And it was mail order retail. Yep. It was the killer app of the Your railroad retail. age. Right. It took 50 years to go from putting down rails and building steam engines to discovering what to do with that stuff. And that's where we are with respect to the microprocessor. All right, that's a good segue. I want to open it up to questions from you all, because I feel guilty hogging, uh, hogging the brains up here. I want, please, each of the three of you to finish up by addressing um, one final question. Could you please tell us, as you look ahead, not singularity, crazy, distant future, next 5, 10, maybe a little bit farther out, tell us what you're most optimistic about and most pessimistic about. George? Am I going to call, call some, George? So uh, I'll start with optimism, uh, and, maybe, and maybe, it, maybe it is actually both. Um, so, so Forrester gathers data on consumers and customers uh, worldwide, about 85% of the world's GDP. And what we're observing, this is, I think in, we all intuitively know this, is that the customer is becoming incredibly powerful, using, and that power shift has really been driven by technology. So yep. one, very powerful. Two, we, we, as we look at the y, uh, X generation next to the Y generation next to the Z generation, we see extraordinary, extraordinarily uh, uh, major shifts in behavioral change yep. in those generations. And we're just now getting data on the Z generation, which is 18 and younger. So very powerful, very dynamic. And then three, it's kind of, it's trite to say it, but highly, highly mobile. As it turns out, human beings move a lot. And now we have the technology to move and to, be, and, and, and to exercise our power at the same time. So we believe we're headed into a 20 year period, we call it the age of the, age of the empowered customer. Yep where uh, institutions are losing power uh, to these customers or consumers. Uh, they're going, the, the only true advantage for companies going forward is they're going to have to have extraordinary customer experience to be able to retain, to be able to serve, and to be able to win those new customers. That's so what it's all about. Let me jump on that. What kinds of companies or, or brands or industries, or answer however you want, are in the most trouble, are really going to get whacked upside the head by this trend? Yeah, we, I, yeah, there's a graph that just flashed to my head, which I, I can share with everyone in the room. But uh, it starts with media. It starts. It starts with the bit-oriented businesses. Yep. Um, healthcare. We actually are doing, uh, inspired somewhat by your work. We're looking at how many jobs will be lost in the next 10 years in the United States job categories, and we see about 15 to 17 percent of the job categories being lost in the next 10 years. Okay. And a lot of those are in office admin. A lot of them are in healthcare, as it turns out. Okay. Um, so. Uh, so it is, it is, you know, we don't want to blame this on Jeff Bezos. We don't want to blame this on Mark Zuckerberg. It, we should blame all of this, your, the world you're describing, Andy, on the customer. The customer <laughs> is demanding this level, of, uh, this level of convenience. But isn't it true? This they, level of they, instantaneous response. That they didn't know that it was even possible until, in, until the, the, the geniuses of the web age came along and gave them beautiful experiences, until Steve Jobs and Jeff Bezos. Yeah, but unfortunately, that expectation curve is now, is now run wild. I mean, I, I was at a party last night, and a plane was flying overhead. And someone grabbed my, my iPhone, I don't know if I could do that, and hit Siri and said, plane's overhead. And it looked down, and it put up the exact number of that plane going overhead. Uh, uh, Get out of here. I'm not kidding. Look, take your iPhone. Hit, hit Siri, go, plane's overhead. And it'll tell you every plane around you. And today, I was on the plane, so I, I downloaded the version of this thing. <laughs> I'm on the plane. Of course, I'm using it on the plane. I'm not supposed to do that. And I did, have LT, I did have LTE on the plane. And I could actually use the radar. On the, I could see, I had radar. I could see every plane around me. As the plane went by in New York, I, I, I knew that was JetBlue 1673. Wow. Okay, so, so now where is so, your... And by the way, that did not put anyone out of work. Understand. That's, that's actually giving me... Uh, there's a machine working, this, and I'm now using that machine. So that, that's actually a very positive part of all of this. So where's your pessimism? I'm... Hmm. I thought that was. I, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's strange because reading your, your book, I love your book. Um, oh, great. I brought you down. Thanks. <laughs> well, we talk about, you know, labor, labor being dear and, you know, labor being, you know, uh, or, or, or there being, a, I'm sorry, you're being, there being a surplus of labor in the world you're describing. The world that I live in, we, we advise all the, you know, the, the CIO, JP Morgan, all the technology people, these companies and the marketing people, these companies. And they're in a world of where labor is incredibly dear. Yeah. I mean, if you are a Salesforce uh, uh, programmer right now, you're, you're like 250K. You cannot find these people. So our clients are all, they're just looking for people everywhere. And uh, I have three sons, and I'm, I'm moving them all into, 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 into understand programming and to, and to be in computer science because that, you know, there's just 
there's so much optimism in that world. The so, debate rages these days about how much of a skills mismatch there actually is in the economy. It sounds like you're saying there's a pretty big one. I don't really think so. I mean, I, I, I think that uh, I think if you're a geologist, then you'll be you'll have access to tools which will make you a much better geologist. Okay. And so it's not, there's not it, there's not, it's you don't have to be a computer scientist to be a geologist, but to be able to use digital, to, you'll be a, you, you know you will take a step up as a geologist mm. in your efficacy and your effectiveness as in that in that profession. So I guess my major pessimism is really for our clients. It's for the Cisco's of the world and the Apple's of the world, because keeping this pace up, and for the targets of the world, it's exhausting. And for the Macy's of the world, it's just it's it's they it, it, it is business is very hard because of the this demanding customer who is 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 just driving so hard for that experience and will move at any time to any other brand. The the uh, the uh, allegiance to brands is over. There is no allegiance to brands anymore. It doesn't exist. There's only allegiance to customer experience. And last thing I'll say is that every company in the future will be a software company. I don't care if you sell tires or insurance, sure. you will be a software company and your, your, the growth of your revenue, your growth of your profitability, and your EPS will be completely driven by that factor. Hillary, over to you. Sure, so as a programmer, I'm feeling pretty excited right now, but I'm, I'm sorry Sweet. for uh, <laughs> the rest. Way to go, Hillary. <laughs> um, no, the thing I am most optimistic, and I'm a fairly optimistic person in general, is in the way that these technical tools that in some ways can now do things that as a child I would have thought were magic. Um, and even you know, when I say as a child five years ago might have thought were magic. Um, for instance? For, well, I can give you many examples, but the thing I'm most excited about in general is that they are essentially giving us superpowers in the sense that you now have this ability to perceive the planes around you. That is something that as a raw human you would never have access to. We can learn things about the world, about ourselves, that are just otherwise outside our reach. So I'm wearing what is a very simple accelerometer on my wrist, and yet it's monitoring my sleep patterns. I know uh, that when I travel, now I sleep an average of an hour or less per night, really? and I walk 2,000 steps a day less whenever I'm outside of New York City. Uh, yeah. And I can actually take action based on that, that fact. And this is the dumbest device. Like yeah. This is cheap, and it is extremely simple. So if you start to think ahead for what these things will look like, uh, even just next year, uh, it's incredibly exciting. Um, and so that's what I'm optimistic about, our tools that are simple, that are easy to use, that make our human experience better, that augment our memories, that help us you know, have richer relationships. Lead healthier lives. Make, be, make us better people. Um, and our experience of being people better. What I'm pessimistic about so is that all of this... It's, it's, no, you go ahead. I'm sorry. All of this will be used to sell advertisements. So <laughs> you know, that is the thing I am pessimistic about. But, but what's interesting is that you're not, if I hear you right, you're not pessimistic about technology dehumanizing us, which is another strain of argument we hear a lot these days. I find that that argument tends to come from a position of fear. And again, I, my prior is that I am an optimist, and I feel that uh, I, you should learn to program if only to feel empowered over technology. <laughs> um, it is really well just a very simple switch. Uh, yeah. Whether you are the kind of person where you're using a piece of software and you know it doesn't do what you want and you say, oh, I must have broken it, or if you're the kind of person <laughs> who says, wow, that is a dumb piece of software, I could have done better. Um, like, be the latter kind of person. <laughs> Rock on. All right, Bill. I'm going to start on the downside. Fine. I'm going to start on the downside. We can downside. end on an up note then. That's great. Exactly. And uh, there was another really important book that was just published. It was written by a Frenchman uh, who spent a little time book. at MIT called Thomas Piketty. And it's called Capitalism. And uh, the no, 21st century. No, this time century. I get to correct you. <laughs> you're right. You're right. It's right. called Capital yeah, in the 21st please. Century. Capital in the 21st Century. I'm back century. to level on my Bitcoin balance. No, only half. <laughs> only half. Because the, the, the investment banker is unforgivable. Damn it. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> but um, so what I'm pessimistic about is the manner in which, once again, it's happened before, the distribution of power in the market economy where you know, dollars vote and the distribution of power in the political process where people vote, if yep. they're allowed to, uh, that the shift has swung disproportionately back, as it had in the 20s, as it did in the 90, 1890s. It swung to a point where I think it's unsustainable. I think that in the, in, in the near term, all of these wonderful things yep. are going to, in, to, to have a tremendously positive impact Great. on maybe 10, maybe 20% of the population of this country. Okay. 
Median income in this country is barely $50,000 a year. 50000 a year. You know, that's, that's one year's tuition yep. at, uh, at MIT. Yep. And from that, you pay for everything. Um, you know, we, we, I, I won't go into yep. the distributional downside. But I think that is what I'm really pessimistic about. So you, now, you combine like the, the Larry Lessig story with the Tomah Piketty story, yeah. and there's, there's some real cause for concern there. Yes. Another book you should all read. There are two books in your pack for today when you've devoured those. The book that Bill mentions is called Capital in the 21st Century. It's got more than two centuries worth of data about wealth and income and inequality, many countries around the world. It's a very, it's fantastic, serious book. I'm, yep. now, now, the upside. The upside, the upside comes from um, the fellow who was the mentor of my mentor in graduate school in old Cambridge, England. So my mentor was John Maynard Keynes's number one student, wow. Richard Kahn, the inventor of the multiplier. And the end of the general theory, the last sentence of the general theory has this famous quotation, which I'll get roughly right, <laughs> which is that sooner or later, it is ideas, not vested interests, that are this is Keynes's term, that are dangerous for good and evil. And I do believe that what I began by talking about, the reconstruction of financial economics, taking seriously the manner in which markets work and markets fail, yep. the inevitable intrusion of enterprises that represent the state, that represent mm. the public, that these ideas will serve not to define new policies in the next five years or even 10, but to define the context in which policies are debated over the next generation. And I think that's a very, very good thing. So Keynes believed and you believe that ideas are even more powerful than vested interests in money. Sooner or later, as he put it, madmen who hear voices in the air and practical businessmen who have no use for intellectual analysis are, 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 he didn't say channeling, we would say channeling the ideas of some defunct economist. I can't think of a better <laughs> note to end on than that, but what we want to do now is open it up for questions from you all. Please, again, gesticulate wildly, and, and um, we'll take it from there. Yeah, hi. I want to I throw out a, uh, a hypothesis and, and, and then have you all respond to it. Um, I'm a professional journalist. I grew up in... in you know, learning that you do research, you, you quote experts, and you write, and you leave yourself out of the story. Um, it seems to me that, and I don't, we can argue about correlation and causation, but it seems to me that as technology has advanced and the web has grown, that people are becoming stupider, that as a writer, I'm looking at the journalism of today, and it's, it's what I might have gotten a B on in sixth grade. It's, it's horrendous. It bears no resemblance, and, and a picture draws as many clicks or more clicks than a 1,200-word thoughtful article that educates, and I think this is having an effect. And it seems to me that technology is advancing, but people are... are, are so, so this is a classic argument. Technology is making us dumber. So do, do you no, include the New York Times in that? Do I include... Or the Wall Street uh, Journal? Yeah, I used to write for the Times and the Journal, and they're not the publications I wrote for back in the day. Yeah, okay. I think that's right. Yeah. So, so I believe I do have something to say about clicks on dumb things on the Internet, <laughs> having spent much of the last five years looking at just that data. <laughs> um, and I will tell you that uh, the click is the wrong metric. So um, for one thing, we are measuring the wrong thing and assigning it way too much value. Mm. Um, when people click through an image, uh, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as when they click through a New York Times story and spend 10 minutes really reading and thinking about an article. Uh, so part of the problem in the journalism industry is that people are optimizing for the wrong things. Yeah, and that leads right for to SEO, a lot of- not for content. Well, right. Um, the other side of this is that uh, that kind of really sixth grade level of formulaic writing will be done by machines within the year. So I wouldn't really worry about it too much. Um. <laughs> <laughs> could, I, could I get you guys to weigh in on the technologies making yeah. us dumber? Um, well, first of all, I, I remember when the, you know, 20 years ago as the internet was, was emerging and people were talking about how it was going to become this sort of hugely democratizing environment where everybody's ideas and everybody's thoughts are good. Well, that's not, that, you know, obviously that's bullshit. What emerges, what emerges in a kind of dark. Are you saying that fashion, no democratization has gone on? No, I, I, it has, but what's emerged 
has been a kind of Darwinian evolution in field after field after field of intermediaries who earn followers' trust. Now, in the, in the geek world, you know, I, I look at what Tim O'Reilly is interested in, right? That's my first default. In economics, I go to Brad DeLong, yep. first default. And there you find, through them, a process of selecting and curating useful and interesting stuff that may be stimulating, it may be explanatory, it may be dead wrong, but it may be, but it, but it's not um, stupid. And I think mm. this curating function that has emerged, just the way Forrester emerged in the world of, you know, when you had all this stuff about, God, is a Vax better than an AS400? Or tell me about Data General, and it was all buzzwords and stuff. So you got trusted curating sources. Mm -hmm. um, now the, you get paid subscriptions. Yes. Brad DeLong does not. Yeah. So there is an economic business model yep. challenge yep. for these curating institutions. Though I do notice, I think uh, that the Times has just effectively raised its prices yep. by introducing its new high quality service. And by the way, it is going to cost you a little bit more. So, and the Times is actually starting, I think, beginning to make more money from the website, it's approaching what they make, certainly beyond what they make from print subscription and approaching what they get from advertising. So let's get another question. Do we have, well, my, oh, yep, center. please. Hi, I'm Howard Rosenberg. I, I flew in from the Silicon Valley just for this conference, so thank you very much. I, I, how are we doing so far? <laughs> well, one of the, um, as you know. <laughs> that didn't sound good, Andy. I know. It, it, I'm, my, I'm not smiling my enough. <laughs> One of the, uh, as you know, the largest ones, the Facebooks, and all of these, these huge successful companies have really nothing to do originally with analytics. So my, my comment and question is, uh, it's a combination of quantum physics, the billion dollar public relations, relations industry, and the truism now that, that the success of a product in the market has less to do with the technical wizardry of the product than the public's perception, the market's perception of that product. Um, so at the, the very oldest, over 100 years ago, the quantum physicists, through the, the wave function, realized at a micro, micro level that the actual reality is very much tied up in the ob observer, whether it's a human observer or another consciousness. And the, consciously or unconsciously, the public relations industry knows that the public perception of a concept, whether it's a market concept, a product concept, so a concept. Are, are we seeing that tech is, is, is largely driven by PR and perception? And if so, is it more than it used to be? I, I would say that the, the, uh, my answer to the question is that, that it, it can be true for, it, I would go back, let's say, 10 years ago in technology. That could be true for a 24-month period. But ultimately, ultimately, the product was judged for its quality and for its efficiency or efficacy, whatever. And now that, is, that has gone from 24 months to, to in the area of six months right. because of this very, very powerful customer who has no allegiance to any brands at all. We'll move as, move, we see this in, in the social world. No kid, very, very few kids that I'm talking with under the age of 15 are using Facebook. Why? Because all, I'm on there. That's why. Mm. Well, well the, 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 <laughs> and their parents are on. We need, there. we need, they're, they're, they're we need to get our other on. panelists to weigh on. on this if they like. And then, I'm, we, I'm sorry, but we do just, have a lot of questions. Let me out let there. me ask the quick question then. I think you just did. Uh, well, <laughs> what is the uh, in in the when we're talking initially about the prediction? Where is the quantum physics, the observer function in predicting how some trends going to play out? Because at a because on a quantum physics level, every macro is just a summation of everything on a micro. Yeah, and I would say, it, it, I, I like your effect. I think it exists, but it's, it's a short-term effect. By the way, I and couldn't disagree short. more. Macro is not the consequence of just adding together the micro. That's why we had 2008. That's why the basic economics of, that was pro propagated as the consistent model doesn't work, and that's why we have coordination failures, which are where the fun is. Yep. Thank you. Um, Andy, I think I heard you say that financial economics is so complex that you couldn't get a machine learning based hedge fund that does value investing. Do you really mean that? You have two value investors on the stage. Don't you think, are you guys sure you won't be replaced by machine learning, maybe a Google Ventures? Well, you know, when the machines work out how to read the personas mm. of the entrepreneurs, because I'm saying that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a data 
skewed world. My experience has been that one of the only predictors of who will not do well in as a venture capitalist is, is someone who is profoundly, deeply talented analytically. Ah. Because they're going to spend all their time working on the hard stuff, on where you have data. But you have to make judge, you have to integrate across from the hard stuff to the soft stuff. And then, and then, and this is where firms succeed and fail, you have to build in how do you hedge against what you can't anticipate? How do you take seriously the role of being able to have access to more cash than you rationally need? <laughs> because that's what buys you the time to find out what the hell is going wrong as the company goes off track. And then you better have enough control to do something about it. It's what I call cash and control is the retrospective hedge against the unanticipatable. If you don't have either, you're a pigeon. You, you seem yeah. unworried that algorithms are going to be able to mimic those, those human judgments, those human functions. Not in my lifetime, not in but life. not even in Hillary's. Not even in Hillary's <laughs> lifetime. No, okay. it, it, but to go to this point about people, uh, I think you're saying, Bill, that pe this, the people factor is, is, large, is, a, is extraordinary. If you look at Google, right? Google tried to build this as an algorithm as who to hire, right? What they found out is that the, the, all the IQ testing they did did not predict success right. in managers at Google. They're now using, they're now going to oh, on the EQ side and they're looking at the soft stuff and yeah. with much greater success. Related to the Google Ventures question, I'd like to ask Hillary, where do you see venture capital going five to 10 years from now? Will the data scientists be running the top mm. venture capital <laughs> firms? Will we be seeing intensive psychological tests of entrepreneurs oh, created by the data scientists? What, what do you predict? All right, so I will answer this question to the best of my ability with the caveat that I am not an investor. I do work at a VC fund and I uh, work closely with partners there, but I don't myself listen to pitches or make investments. Mm. I mostly do diligence, support existing companies and sort of help clarify the vision for the fund of what we think data will look like in the next five to 10 years. Mm. So that's what I mostly concentrate on. That said, no, I absolutely don't think that uh, you know, people will come in with their brilliant entrepreneurial idea and will say, play this video game and we're going to evaluate <laughs> your ability to succeed in the world. Um, in fact, I think if you did want to build a model uh, to use to guide your VC investments, the best model you could build today would be a model of the models every other VC fund is trying to build. Yeah. And then you use that information to guide your pricing and your, your investment decisions alongside your partners. Uh, simply because it is still, the time scales are very long. Yep. Uh, the environment is always changing, mm -hmm. and it's, it's a very difficult problem to say we're going to solve it purely analytically. Yeah. Here, here. Where are we? Uh, where are we? Go. How's it going? Um, so I'm in digital advertising, the pessimistic outlook that you mentioned, Hillary. And uh, from <laughs> that lens, I read the book, Who Owns the Future? Jonah Lanier. I'm not sure if anybody's read it. Um, yeah, OK, great. And uh, so we're talking about wealth inequality, but as far as information inequality, who owns information? Should it be meant to be aggregated by Google, Facebook, Rocket Fuel? Um, like, I'd, I'd like to hear the perspective, both from the capitalist perspective and the philosopher's perspective. So the, I'm sure you've all heard the saying that if you get something for free, you are not the customer. Uh, and Jaron Lanier's thesis was that everyone, everyone that Google's aggregating should get paid yeah. every time they are aggregated. Every time your face appears on a security camera, you should get paid. Yeah. There's there, now, I think, I think there's now four startups who are going to be doing real-time uh, photography of the planet. So there's going to be a picture of your apartment or house every day, maybe twice or three times a day. He's saying you should get paid for that. Yeah. In so, which case, none of those businesses would ever start or exist. That's right. Yeah, part A of this, I agree with. Part B seems to have a very naive sense of the, the capital value of your participation. Just, just so you know, this is, this is a very old it's argument. It's been very capitalistically valued to, valuable to Google. Not, ni 90 years ago, the godfather of radio, the godfather of radio, not David Sarnoff, who implemented it, but the guy who created the environment in which broadcast radio could take off was a radical character named Herbert Hoover. <laughs> he was Secretary of Commerce, and in collaboration with the Navy, he forced into Radio Corporation of America, GE, Westinghouse, American Marconi, everybody who had patents mm. around wireless broadcasting. Well, he had no idea that it was going to be for broadcasting. Originally, it was narrowcasting, ship to shore, the Titanic. That was the, that was the 
killer app for the first generation of wireless. Then Westinghouse creates a, a radio station in Pittsburgh, starts broadcasting, they can't get paid. So they introduce advertising. And Herbert Hoover says, this is polluting a public asset, this radical socialist so Herbert noted, Hoover. Noted pinko Herbert Hoover. Nober, so. Noted pinko Herbert Hoover. So this argument about who owns the future is at least 90 years old and will recur endlessly as we go forward. What's your take on it? Should we, should we be forcing companies to pay people for the data they collect from them? Well, first of all, there's a question between should and can. Yes. Right? Um, second, we are going to generate exhaust in doing things that we want to do. Third, another, yet another book, Eric Schmidt's book. Yeah. Eric, Eric uh, has three, three really important points. One is um, nothing you do on the net is ever lost, ever. No matter what they tell you, no matter if Google says, we'll wipe your history, forget about it. It's not just the NSA that has your history. Google keeps it. Second, if your persona, your online persona, the traces that Hillary can aggregate and analyze are richer than your, quote, real life persona. There's more data. Mm -hmm. And third, and this is his real point, if you don't take responsibility for managing your online persona, somebody else just might. So as this is, again, this is an inequality. How do you learn how, you know, at a certain point, when they were still on Facebook, all those teenagers who decided they wanted to get into college, or maybe they, having gotten into college, they actually wanted to get a job, started trying to clean up their Facebook pages, right? They started to take responsibility for their personas. So I don't think that we're going to be able to charge companies for using what we do. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to have to take responsibility for what we do and for the consequences of that. And then finally, and this was Eric's last point, this becomes a public policy problem. Yep. This is not going to be resolved in the market economy. Sooner or later, this is exactly why regulatory regimes always emerge around new technologies. It yep. takes time. I would love to keep this going. We are sadly out of time. The good news is there's lots more great stuff coming this afternoon. I'd like to thank Hillary, Bill, and George for joining us. Thank you. Thank Thanks, Andrew. Great. Thank you, Bill.